morning everybody if there's anybody lurking in the background this is Donald Blondahl Hall of Fame veteran sports cards and collectibles coming to you live from Arlington Washington with an, another and actually this is a final episode of the baseball team history and today's will be of the Chicago Cubs Depending on how many people we have watching, there's a possibility me open up this hobby box here, 2020 top series to hobby box. And the question, question, question is if we don't have enough for the hobby box, we will open up some of the the medallion card packs. I still have 30 of those remaining, and we will go by the when I'm done the history lesson for the Chicago Cubs. When I am done the history lesson for the... Sh Let me actually open this up a different way. Before people start showing up, I'm always in here early. And today I chose to be really, really early. <laughs> so I'm going to just see if I can avoid knocking anything over. And just kind of have these kind of set in, in the background here. All right. Those are my Rookie Medallion coin cards, packs. Do have 30 of them. We will open up some of those, given the opportunity to do so. Actually, you know what? I got a spacer I can put in there. I think it should fit. To kind of hold them up so they're not tipping over. There we go. Now I've got those lined up in there. Let me fold that, get that out of the way. So there we go. Have that in space. Normally people know that I go about 10.15. I did pop on at 10.10 today. Just wanted to go about five minutes earlier. Get my little introduction in for those that turn on the video early. Uh, we are doing the Chicago Cubs today for our final team history. Then I will finalize my playlist for the, the baseball team history. Since I have all 31 baseball teams plus a few minor and or older uh, teams before they migrated into what we know today as our 30 Major League Baseball teams. And I just wanted to take a moment um, it was a slight sad day in baseball yesterday. They canceled three three games, of which for some people that's bad, but then you get to watch doubleheaders today. Since the those six teams, or three main teams, I guess it was because one of the teams in the groups were protesting what took place here recently in the news. So it's a sad day when they start taking a political stand over... Um, what they do on the baseball field. They're supposed to be playing a game and a sport in which they love instead of participating in politics in the sport. That's why people are slowly dropping away from, from football. Um, they kind of sparked the interest when they got the 60-game season going, but I think that's... Uh, making a lot of people think about okay what's baseball done now now they're taking not necessarily taking a knee during the national anthem and stuff but taking a knee before the game before the the national anthems played so yeah i'm ranting and raving and i am wearing a different t-shirt today in honor of the great country in which we live in and the great country in which i served my country 40 years in uniform to help support and defend for those 40 years in uniform. For those that don't know, I spent 20 years in the United States Navy and proudly served my country during my tenure in the military. And then I proudly served my country delivering people's mail for 20 years. And so now I am fully retired and am totally disdained on the direction our country is heading. 
So at the end of the stream today, in my signature goodbye, I will turn around, turn the camera around, and you'll see my shirt and my my uh, baseball cap that I'm wearing today, a symbol of my stance and where I stand in the current atmosphere in our country. Don't want to bring all the politics into the stream here, but do want to just mention it just a little bit. We only, I only have two people watching. It might be just myself and one other person. Don't know for sure. But uh, just wanted to kind of let my voice be heard in that aspect of uh, what we are doing today. So again, I am doing the baseball team history of the Chicago Cubs. And that is my final uh, baseball team history video installment. I may add different ones if different people want uh, a minor league, a single, a double, or a triple A team highlighted in my channel. I'll add that into my baseball team history content. Um, but other than that, uh, I can't really think of anything else to, to talk about prior to leading up to my 1030 kickoff for the baseball team history of the Chicago Cubs. I'm sure at one point in my stream here, I will have some people start showing up. I sure hope they do. It would be my blessing to interact with people and share the content in my channel and the way that I do. Um, but other than that, I'll kind of just be hanging out here in the background. Um, can't think of anything else to talk about um oh as far as brewers cards uh the winner of my contest for last month i think i figured out what happened i'm just waiting on a response and the emails i sent out to the two people involved i truly apologize for sending uh, the, the cards to the wrong individual but if that did happen, um, and uh, you do not get that, it might not be those uh, same seven cards, but I will pick you out uh, uh, seven cards, and I'll be in touch with you via email and stuff to get, get you uh, seven baseball cards of your choosing and or preference as far as uh, whom and what you uh, do collect. So I just wanted to toss that out there real quick. Hopefully uh, things work out there. Hopefully the, the person I sent them to in error will either send them back to me or I can uh, PayPal him some money to pay for the postage to have them sent to Brewers Cards uh, forever. Uh, I do apologize for that, but that's the only thing that I can see that might have happened. Um, and Brewers Cards Forever, if you do happen to re replay and watch this video here today, um, do reach out to me. I did send an email message to you on Patreon and have not heard a response back from you either. So um, I deeply, deeply apologize for that. And I will make sure that uh, this coming Saturday when I do my end of the month giveaway, because this will be the last day this Saturday that you'll be able to enter in for the August contest because I am off on Sundays and Mondays and that's the last two days of the month so uh, I will just leave that right there for now we do have just less than 10 minutes to go before we get into the content at and for today Other than that, I can't really think of anything else to particularly talk about today. Um, it helps when I do have somebody to interact with, but there is nobody watching as of yet. Um, I know my stream is working. I know it is working, that's for sure. So, everything is definitely working well there because I can see on my other computer um, yeah 
looks like everything is working fine. It's just my viewership has really been dropping off lately, which is fine. Cards in my car with our Posada at 1022, 12 minutes into the live stream. He is here. Let me get cards in my car with our Posada into my drawing for the month of August. All right. Cards in my car with our Posada. Let me get you in here real quick. You have another entry into my August drawing. Just so you do know. Okay, appreciate you being here, Robert. Uh, wow, well, didn't get a notification today, but I'm here. Oh, really? That that's weird. Um, that's okay. Sometimes that happens. Do me a favor when you do get a chance, just go to my uh, channel page and make sure. Sometimes over periods of time, um, YouTube will turn off the bell notifications. All you have to do is turn them back on and you'll start receiving them. And that's one way to take care of that. So um, if you do that, I think that will be a help and uh, a blessing just to make sure. Um, just to make sure that it is turned on. Looking at a commercial that's showing on my channel on my other computer and stuff. I do that to kind of monitor to see what's going on and stuff. Um, I sign in with my ghost account, <laughs> my my lurking account. So, uh, but yeah, it's showing a a neat little commercial about Amazon and how. Um, Amazon is making a move to uh, take over possibly old and abandoned uh, shopping malls to make uh, their presence more well known throughout the United States. That is very interesting. Very, very interesting. neat commercial uh, it's back on just did that thank you Don okay had your bell been turned off that's what I think a lot of people don't know for sure after a month or two you might want to just check a person's channel make sure you got their bell notifications still on because it's not no part of yours but sometimes it is when you're not interacting with the channel in like what they call the background mode as far as going and checking on videos and replaying videos so, I found that with some of my people I subscribe to one time I went back it had been a month or so since I went to Jab's family and for some reason his bell notification was turned off on my on my side so I just had to click on it to turn the bell notification back on so I think it has something to do with the YouTube analytics and stuff but um, I'm just going to keep plugging away. That could be what's happened with a lot of the people on my channel. Because they're not interacting on a regular basis. So then YouTube does not know for sure if they are there. But we've got about three more minutes. I can do some general chit-chatting. And then we will go into our baseball team history of the Chicago Cubs. Hopefully you can see me in the background here. I'm waving my hands. Because you can see my reflection in the Chicago Cubs uh little uh, uh hologram cards these are from uh 1991 upper deck 
I have a whole bunch of these and I use these sometimes when I do my team histories. So we have almost two more minutes. Looks like my long commercial is almost done for the next Amazon. That is an interesting little commercial there. than that everything is going fine doing well and enjoying life in the fast lane no oh my word my wife is trying to encourage me I think <laughs> she's got the little emoji emoji super chat there number one fan <laughs> thank you there sweetheart appreciate that thank you for that super chat that emo emoji <laughs> let me get her her had to get her a 10 bell ringer for that one ten dollars super sticker saying she's my number one fan she <laughs> she was uh she put some she watched some of my videos and put some things in there she says how come nobody's commenting on your videos don't they like your content i'm like well most people just chat in the chat room with me when i do my live stream she said yeah but they're supposed to leave you comments too because comments mean that you're doing a good job i said well you can't make people make comments and <laughs> in your videos they have to be willing to do that on their own um, but uh, <laughs> thanks sweetheart for that $10 super chat there I appreciate that I like that on my phone it doesn't show the little the little number one fan jumping up and down and saying number one fan it just says $10 from Cynthia Blomdahl pair character jumping up and down saying number one fan number one fan <laughs> but oh wait I almost forgot sweetheart believe it or not you got 10 entries into my August giveaway that's one one entry per uh, one entry per dollar on the super chat so that gives you 10 entries there sweetie sure I got it right one two three four five six seven eight nine ten ten entries into my August giveaway I think maybe if my wife wins I'll have to have I have to spin the wheel again that would almost seem like it's rigged if I if I let her win. Plus, she wouldn't want the, the, the eight baseball cards that I'm giving away anyway. But thanks for popping that into the stream there, sweetheart. <laughs> I really do appreciate that. Was not necessary, but thank you very much, sweetie. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me get back into the stream here. That's it. I did save it, right? Yep. Okay. So get back in the stream here. It's only... Looks like it's only 
Uh, it says three watching. Oh, my wife's watching. I'm watching. And Robert's watching. So that, that must be the three that are here. Me, my wife, and you, Robert. But that's okay. It is... Oh, wow. Because of that, it, it put me over. But thanks there, sweetie, for that... That... Um, Super chat there. We're going to get into our lesson at hand because the one for today is uh, one of those bigger ones too because it is the Chicago Cubs. They've been around for like forever. <laughs> so you can sit back and relax now there, Robert. I'm going to go ahead and get into our history lesson and then we will see by the end of it how many people are showing up here. Again, there's a possibility we could do the hobby box. We'll see how things go. But if not, we will open up some of these packs for the Medallion Coins in my quest to get my 50 card complete set. And if I do, before I go through all these packs, that could be nice because then at my sale next Saturday, we could end up putting these up in the sale and see if people want to buy some of these. Okay, so without further ado, let's get into the Chicago Cubs, and we will go to town here. So the Chicago Cubs are an American professional baseball team based in Chicago, Illinois. The Cubs compete in Major League Baseball as a member club of the National League Central Division. The team plays its home games at Wrigley Field, located on the city's north side. The Cubs are one of two Major League teams in Chicago. The other... The Chicago White Sox is a member of the American League Central Division. The Cubs, first known as the White Stockings, were a founding member of the National League in 1876, becoming the Chicago Cubs in 1903. The Cubs have appeared in a total of 11 World Series. The 1906 Cubs won 116 games, finishing 116 and 36, and posting a modern ER era record winning percentage of 763 before losing the World Series to the Chicago White Sox. The hitless wonders by four games to two. The Cubs won back-to-back -back World Series championships in 1907 and 1908, becoming the first major league team to play in three consecutive World Series and the first to win it twice. Most recently, the Cubs won the 2016 National League Championship Series and the 2016 World Series, which ended a 71-year National League pennant drought and a 100 eight-year World Series championship drought, both of which are record droughts in Major League Baseball. The 108-year-old drought was also the longest such occurrence in all major North American sports since the start of divisional play in 1969. The Cubs have appeared in the postseason 10 times throughout the 2019 season. The Cubs are known as the Northsiders, a reference to the location of Wrigley Field within the city of Chicago, and a constant contrast to the White Sox, whose home field, guaranteed rate field, is located on the south side. As far as the history of the baseball club, the early club history from 1876 to 1902, a national league. The Cubs began playing in 1870 as the Chicago White Stockings joined the National League in 1876 as a charter member. Owner William Hobart signed multiple star players such as pitcher Albert Spaulding and infielders Ross Barnes, Deacon White, and Adrian Cap Anson. To join the team prior to the National League's first season, the White Stockings played their home games at West Side Grounds and quickly established themselves as one of the new league's top teams. Spalding won 47 games and Barnes led the league in hitting at 429 as Chicago won the first ever National League pennant, which at the time was the game's top prize. After back-to-back -back pennants in 1980 and 1981, Holbert died and Spalding, who had retired to start Spalding Sports Goods, assumed ownership of the club. The White Stockings, with 
Anson, acting as player manager, captured their third consecutive pennant in 1882. And Anson established himself as the game's first true superstar. In 1885 and 1886, after winning the National League pennants, the White Stockings met the champions of the short-lived American Association in that era's version of a World Series. Both seasons resulted in matchups with the St. Louis Brown Stockings with the clubs tying in 1885 with the St. Louis winning in 1886. This was the genesis of what would eventually become one of the greatest rivalries in sports. And all the Anson-led Chicago-based club won six National League pennants between 1876 and 1886. As a result, Chicago's club nickname transitioned and by 1890 they became known as the Chicago Colts or sometimes Anson's Colts referring to Cap's influence with the club. Anson was the first player in history credited with collecting 3,000 career hits. After a disappointing record of 59 and 73 and a ninth place finish in 1897, Anson was released by the Cubs as both a player and manager. Due to Anson's absence from the club, after 22 local newspaper reporters started to refer to the Colts as the orphans. After the 1900 season, the American Baseball League formed as a rival professional league, and incidentally, the club's old White Stockings nickname, eventually shortened to White Sox, would be adopted by a new American League neighbor to the south. All right. In 1902 to 1920, a Cubs dynasty. Pop in the chat real quick. Make sure I'm not missing anything here. All right. In 1902, Spalding, who by this time had revamped the roster to boast what would soon be one of the best teams of the early century, sold the club to Jim Hart. The franchise was nicknamed the Cubs by the Chicago Daily News in 1902, although not officially becoming the Chicago Cubs until the 1907 season. During this period, which has become known as baseball's dead ball era, Cub infielders Joe Tinker, Johnny Evers, and Frank Chance were made famous as a double play combination by Franklin P. Adams' poem, Baseball's Sad Lexicon. The poem first appeared in the July 18, 1910 edition of the New York Evening Mail. Mordecai, Three Finger Brown, Jack Taylor, Ed Rolbach, Jack Fieser, and Orville Overall were several key pitchers for the Cubs during this time period. With Chance acting as a player manager from 1905 to 1912, the Cubs won four pennants and two World Series titles over a five-year span. Although they fell to the hitless wonders, White Sox, in the 1906 World Series, the Cubs recorded a record 116 victories and the best winning percentage of 763 in Major League history. With mostly the same roster, Chicago won back-to-back -back World Series championships in 1907 and 1908, becoming the first Major League club to play three times in the Fall Classic and the first to win it twice. However, the Cubs would not win another World Series until 2016. This remains the longest championship drought in North American professional sports. The next season, veteran catcher Johnny King left the team to become a professional pocket billiards player. Some historians think King's absence was significant enough to prevent the Cubs from winning a third straight title in 1909 as they finished six games out of first place. When uh, Kling returned the next year, the Cubs won the pennant again, but lost to the Philadelphia Athletics in the 1910 World Series. We pop in the chat. Donald, I think there was a sniper on the hill in Arlington. <laughs> uh, John saying the hi to uh, hi to my wife Cynthia and the hi to Robert. Thanks for popping in here, John. Appreciate you and you always make an appearance in the in the chat here. Appreciate it. And uh, 
Good morning, John. Okay, that, that's the card to my car with Harpasad is saying that. All right, let me continue on here as we continue to move forward. Um, in 1914, advertising executive Albert Lasker obtained a large block of the club's shares and before the 1916 season, assumed majority ownership of the franchise. Lasker brought a wealthy partner, Charles Wegman, uh, the proprietor of a popular chain of lunch counters who had previously owned the Chicago Whales of the short-lived Federal League. As principal owners, the pair moved the club from the west side grounds to the much newer Wig, uh, Wigman Park, which had been constructed for the Whales only two years earlier. Where they remain to this day, the Cubs responded by winning a pennant in the war-shortened season of 1918, where they played a part in another team's curse. The Boston Red Sox defeated Grover Cleveland Alexander's Cubs four games to two in the 1918 World Series, Boston's last series championship until 2004. Beginning in 1916, Bill Wrigley of the Chewing Gum fame acquired an increasingly an increasing quantity of stock in the Cubs. By 1921, he was the majority owner, maintaining that status into the 1930s. Meanwhile, the 1919 in the year 1919, saw the start of the tenure of Bill Veek Sr. as team president. Veek would hold that post throughout the 20s and 30s, and the management team of Wrigley and Veek came to be known as the Double Bills. Pop in the chat here. Uh, I love Wegmans. It's a grocery chain. <laughs> we don't have one of them here in Stockton, California, John. Yeah, I've never... It's probably just a Midwest type thing. Wegmans, great grocery chain. But, uh... Very, very interesting. For sure. Alright. Let me continue on here. Oh, it's an East Coast chain. That makes sense. East Coast. Probably every, probably east of the Mississippi. <laughs> That'd be my guess. All right, the Wrigley years from 1921 to 1945. If I, uh, see, if I, if I got to choose the coast, I got to choose the east. I live out there, so don't go there. <laughs> All right, so from 1929 to 1938, <coughs> called every three years. Hold on a second. I gotta get a sip of water here. All right. You probably see me if you're drinking my water with in my little hologram cards here. If you take a notice to it. Near the end of the first decade of the Double Bills guidance, the Cubs won the National League pennant in 1929, and then achieved the unusual feat of winning a pennant every three years following up to 1929, flagged uh, with league titles in 1932, 1935, and 1938. Unfortunately, their success did not extend to the, to the Fall Classic as they fell in their, to their American League rivals each time. The 32 series against the Yankees featured Babe Ruth's called shot at Wrigley Field and Game 3. There were some historic moments for the Cubs as well. In 1930, Hack Wilson, one of the top home run hitters in the game, had one of the most impressive M seasons in MLB history, hitting 56 home runs and establishing the current runs batted in record of 191. That 1930 club, which boasted six eventual Hall of Famers, uh, Wilson, Gabby Harnett, Rogers Hornsby, George High Pockets Kelly, Kiki Collier, and manager Joe McCarthy, established the current team batting average record of 309. In 1935, the Cubs claimed the pennant in thrilling fashion, winning a record 21 games in a row in September. 
The 38 club saw Dizzy Dean lead the team's pitching staff and provided a historic moment when they won a crucial late-season game at Wrigley Field over the Pittsburgh Pirates with a walk-off home run by Gabby, Gabby Harnett, which became known as, in, in baseball lore as the Homer in the Gloman. After the double bills, Wrigley and Vic died in 1932 and 1933 respectively. P.K. Wrigley, son of Bill Wrigley, took over as majority owner, and he was unable to extend his father's baseball success beyond 1938, and the Cubs slipped into the years of mediocrity. Although Wrigley the Wrigley family would retain control of the team until 1981. Right, pop in the chat real quick. Cardinals fan, 1990. Hi, buddy. <laughs> no problem there, Cardinals fan. Hello, Cardinals fan. Um, dun, 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 dun. Let me refresh the chat so I know where I left off. Continue on with our history lesson. 1945, The Curse of the Billy Goat. The Cubs enjoyed one more pennant at the close of World War II, finishing... Uh, 98 and 56 due to the wartime travel restrictions the first three games of the 1945 World Series were played in Detroit where the Cubs won two games including a one hitter by Claude Posse and the final four were played at Wrigley the Cubs lost the series and did not return until the 2016 World Series. After losing the 1945 World Series to the Detroit Tigers, the Cubs finished with a respectable 82 and 71 record in the following year, but was only good enough for third place. In the following two decades, the Cubs played mostly forgettable ba baseball, finishing among the worst teams in the National League on an almost an annual basis from 1947 to 1966. They only notched one winning season. Longtime infielder manager Phil Cavaretta, who had been a key player during the 1945 season, was fired during spring training in 1954 after admitting the team was unlikely to finish above fifth place, although shortstop Ernie Banks would become one of the star players in the league during the next decade, finding help from him proved a difficult task, as quality players such as Hank Sauer were few and far between. This combined with poor ownership decisions such as the College of Coaches and the ill-fated trade of future Hall of Famer Lou Brock to the Cardinals for pitcher Ernie Brigid Brigid Brigilio, who won only seven games over the next three seasons, hampered on -field, their on-field performance. All right. <laughs> John says... I should do the history of the United States Postal Service. I could tell you an interesting story about that. <laughs> For another day and another stream, probably. <laughs> the fall of 1969. Um, the late 1960s brought hope of a renaissance with third baseman Ron Santo and pitcher Ferguson, Jen Fer Ferguson Jenke Jenkins commonly known as Fergie Jenkins, and outfielder Billy Williams joining Banks. After losing a dismal 103 games in 1966, the Cubs brought home consecutive winning records in 67 and 68, marking the first time a Cub team had accomplished that feat in over two decades. In 1969, the Cubs, managed by Leo DeRocher, built a substantial lead in the newly created National League Eastern Division by mid-August. Ken Holtzman pitched a no-hitter on August 19th, and the division lead led grew to 8.5 games over the St. Louis Cardinals and by 9.5 games over the New York Mets after the game of September 2nd. The Cubs record was 84 and 52 with the Mets in second place at 77 and 55. But then a losing streak began 
just as the Mets' winning streak was beginning. The Cubs lost the final game of a series at Cincinnati, then came home to play the resurgent Pittsburgh Pirates, who would finish in third place. After losing the first two games by a score of 9-2 and 13-4, the Cubs led going into the ninth inning. A win would be a positive springboard since the Cubs were to play a crucial series with the Mets the next day. But Willie Stargell drilled a two-out, two-strike pitch from the Cubs' ace reliever, Phil Reagan, onto Sheffield Avenue to tie the score in the top of the ninth. The Cubs would lose 7-5 to five in extra innings. Uh, burdened by a four-game losing streak, the Cubs traveled to Shea Stadium for a short two-game set. The Mets won both games, and the Cubs left New York with a record of 84-58, and just a half a game in front. More of the same followed in Philadelphia, as a 99-loss Phillies team nonetheless defeated the Cubs twice to extend Chicago's losing streak to eight games. In a key play in the second game on September 11th, Cubs starter Dick Selma threw a surprise pickoff attempt to third baseman Ron Santo, who was nowhere near the bag or the ball. Selma's throwing error opened the gates to a Phillies rally. After that second Phillies loss, the Cubs were 84 and 60, and the Mets had pulled ahead 85 and 57. The Mets would not look back. The Cubs' eight game losing streak finally ended the next day in St. Louis, but the Mets were in the midst of a 10 game winning streak, and the, and the Cubs. Uh, wilting from team fatigue generally deteriorated in all phases of the game. The Mets, who had lost a record 120 games seven years earlier, would go on to win the World Series. The Cubs, despite a respectable 92-70 and record, would be remembered for having lost a remarkable 17 and a half games in the standings to the Mets in the last quarter of the season. All right, let me continue on here. Do refresh on the chat here. I already got John's last statement. All right, 1977 to 1979, June swoon. Following the 1969 season, the club posted winning records for the next few seasons, but no playoff action. After the core players of those teams started to move on, the 70s got worse for the team and then became known as the lovable losers. In 1977, the team found some life, but ultimately experienced one of its biggest collapses. The Cubs hit a watermark on June 28th at 47-22, and 22, boasting an 8.5 game league, National League East lead, as they were led by Bobby Mosser, 27 home runs and 89 RBIs, and Rick Ruschel, 20 and 10. However, the Philadelphia Phillies cut the lead to two by the All Star break as the Cubs sat 19 games over 500, but they swooned late in the season, going 20 and 40 after July 1st. The Cubs finished in fourth place at 81 and 81, while Philadelphia surged, finishing with 101 wins. The following two seasons also saw the Cubs get off to a fast start, as the team rallied over 10 games above 500 well into both seasons, only to again wear down and play poor, poorly later on, and ultimately settling back to mediocrity. The traits became known as the June Swoon. Again, the Cubs usually high number of of games is often pointed to as one reason for the team's inconsistent late season play. Wrigley died in 1977. The Wrigley family sold the team to the Chicago Tribune in 1981, ending a 65-year family relationship with the Cubs. The Tribune Tribune Company years from 1981 to 2008. After over a dozen more subpar seasons in 1981, the Cubs fired GM General Manager Dallas Green from Philadelphia to turn around the franchise. 
Green had managed the 1980 Phillies in the World Series title. One of his early GM moves brought in a young Phillies minor league third baseman named Ryan Sandberg, along with Larry Boa for Ivan De Jesus. The 1983 Cubs finished 71 and 91 under Lee Elia, who was fired before the season ended by Green. Green continued the culture of change and overhauled the Cubs roster, front office, and coach staff prior to 1984. Jim Frey was hired to manage the 1984 Cubs with Don Zimmer coaching and third base and Bill Connors serving as pitching coach. Green shored up the 1984 roster with a series of transactions in December of 1963. 1983, sorry. Scott Sanderson was acquired from Montreal in a three-team deal with San Diego for Carmelo Martinez. Pinch hitter Richie Hebner, 333 batting average in 1984, was signed as a free agent in spring training and moves Continued. Left fielder Gary Matthews and center fielder Bobby Dernier came from Philadelphia on March 26 for uh, Bill Campbell, a minor league leaguer. Reliever Tim Stoddard, 10 and 6 with a 3.82 ERA and 7 saves, was acquired the same day for a minor leaguer veteran pitcher Fergie Jenkins was released. The teams committed to contend was complete when Green made a midseason deal on June 17th to shore up the starting rotation due to injuries to Rick Ruschel, 5-5, five and, five, and Sanderson. The deal brought the 1979 National League Rookie of the Year pitcher Rick Sutcliffe from the Cleveland Indians, Joe Carter, who was with the AAA Iowa Cubs at the time. The right fielder Mel Hall were set to Cleveland for sent to Cleveland for Sutcliffe and backup catcher Ron Hassey. 333 with the Cubs in 1984. Sutcliffe 5-5 five and five with the Indians. Immediately joined Sanderson, who was 8-5 with a 3.14 ERA. Eckersley uh, with a 10-8 and eight record with a 3.03 ERA. Steve Trout. 13 wins, 7 losses with a 3.41 ERA, and Dick Ruthven, 6 and 10 with a 5.04 ERA. In the starting rotation, Sutcliffe proceeded to go for 16 for 1 for the Cubs and captured the Cy Young Award. The Cubs' starting lineup was very strong. It considered it it consisted of left fielder Matthews uh, with a 2.91. Uh, percentage uh, 14 and 82, 101 runs and 17 stolen bases. C. Jody Davis with a 285, 19 and 94. Uh, right fielder Keith Moreland with a 279 average, 16 out of 80. And shortstop Larry Bow with a 223, 10, with 10 stolen bases. First baseman Leon Bull Durham, 279, 23 and 96, and 16 stolen bases. And the stats go on with Ron Say, Lee Smith, Ryan Sandberg. All right. Reserve players Hebner, Thad Bosley, Henry Cotto, Hassey, and Dave Owen produced exciting moments. The bullpen depth of Rich Birdie, George Frazier, Warren Brewstar, and Dickie Knowles did their job in getting the game to Smith or Stoddard. At the top of the order, Denier and Sandberg were exciting, aptly coined the Daily Double by Harry Carey. With strong defense, Denier, center fielder, and Sandberg at second base won the National League Gold Glove. Solid pitching and clutch hitting. The Cubs were well a well-balanced team following the Daily Double. Matthews Durham, Say, Moreland, and Davis gave the Cubs an order with no gaps to pitch around. Sutcliffe anchored a strong top to bottom rotation and Smith was one of the closers in the game. The shift in the Cubs fortunes was characterized June 23rd on the NBC Saturday game of the week. 
contest against the St. Louis Cardinals. It has since been dubbed simply the Sandberg game. With the nation watching and Wrigley Field packed, Sandberg emerged as a superstar with not one but two game-tying home runs against the Cardinals closer Bruce Suter. With his shots in the ninth and 10th inning, Wrigley Field erupted and Sandberg set the stage for a comeback win that cemented the Cubs as the team to beat in the East. No one would catch them. In early August, the Cubs swept the Mets in a four-game home series that further distanced them from the pack. An infamous Keith Moreland, Ed Lynch, fight erupted after Lynch hit Moreland with a pitch, perhaps forgetting Moreland was once a linebacker at the University of Texas. It was the second game of a doubleheader, and the Cubs had won the first game, in part due to a three-run home run by Moreland. After the bench-clearing fight, the Cubs won the second game, and the sweep put the Cubs at 68-45. and 45. In eight, 1984, each league had two divisions, East and West. The division winners met in a Best of Five series to advance to the World Series in a 2-3 format. Uh, first two games were played at the home of the team who did not have home field advantage. Then the last three games were played at the home of the team with home field advantage. Thus the first two games were played at Wrigley Field and the next three at the home of their opponents. San Diego, a common unfounded myth, is that since Wrigley Field did not have lights at night, Time, the National League decided to give the home field advantage to the winner of the National League West. In fact, home field advantage had rotated between the winners of the East and the West since 1969, when the league expanded. In even-numbered years, the National League West had home field advantage. In odd-numbered years, the National League East had home field advantage. Since the National League East winners had home field advantage in 1983, the National League West winners were entitled to it. All right, the confusion may stem from the fact that Major League Baseball did decide that should the Cubs make it to the World Series, the American League winner would have home field advantage unless the Cubs hosted home games at an alternate site since the Cubs home field of Wrigley Field did not have lights. Rumored as the Cubs could not hold games across town at Kaminsky Park, home of the American League Chicago White Sox, rather than hold any games in the crosstown rival Sox Park. The Cubs made arrangements with the August A. Bush owners of the St. Louis Cardinals to use Bush Stadium in St. Louis as the Cubs' home field for the World Series. This was approved by Major League Baseball and would have enabled the Cubs to host games 1 and 2 along with games 6 and 7 if necessary. At the time, home field advantage was rotated between each leg. Odd numbered years, the American League had home field advantage. Even numbered years, the National League had home field advantage. In the 1982 World Series, the St. Louis Cardinals of the National League had home field advantage. In the 1983 World Series, Baltimore Orioles of the American League had home field advantage. In the NLCS, the Cubs easily won the first two games at Wrigley Field against the San Diego Padres. The Padres were the winners of the Western Division with Steve Garvey, Tony Gwynn, Eric Show, Goose Gossage, and Alan Wiggins, with wins of 13 to nothing and 4 to 2. The Cubs needed to win only one game of the next three in San Diego to make it to the World Series. After being beaten in Game 3, 7-1, the Cubs lost Game 4 when Smith hit the game and tied 5-5, allowed a game-winning home run to Garvey in the bottom of the ninth inning. The game in the game... Five, the Cubs took a 3-0 lead in the 6th inning and a 3-2 lead in the 7th with Sutcliffe, who won the Cy Young Award that year. Still on the mound, then Leon Durham had a sharp grounder go under his glove. 
The critical error helped the Padres win the game 6-3 with a four-run seventh inning and keep Chicago out of the 1984 World Series against the Detroit Tigers. The loss ended a spectacular season for the Cubs, one that brought alive the slumbering franchise and made the Cubs relevant for a whole new generation of Cubs fans. The Padres would be defeated in five games by Sparky Anderson's Tigers in the World Series. The 1985 season brought high hopes. The club started out doing well at 35-19 and 19 through mid-June, but injuries to Sutcliffe and others in the pitching staff contributed to a 13-game losing streak that pushed the Cubs out of contention. Let me take a sip of water here real quick. Get on to the next sections we have here. As we get closer to the 2000 era coming up soon. All right. So let me continue on. 1989, the National League East Division Championship. In 1989, the first full season with night baseball at Wrigley Field, Don Zimmer's Cubs were led by a core group of veterans and Ryan Sandberg, Rick Sutcliffe, and Andre Dawson, who were boosted by a crop of youngsters such as Mark Grace, Sean Dunstan, Greg Maddox, and Rookie of the Year Jerome Walton, and Rookie of the Year runner-up Dwight Smith. The Cubs won the National League East once again that season, winning 93 games. This time, the Cubs met the San Francisco Giants in the NLCS after splitting the two first two games at home, the Cubs headed to the Bay Area, where despite holding a lead at some point in each of the next three games, bullpen meltdowns and managerial blunders ultimately led to three straight losses. The Cubs couldn't overcome the effort of Will Clark, whose home run off Maddox, just after a managerial visit to the mound, led Maddox to think Clark knew what pitch was coming. Afterward, Maddox would speak into his glove during any mound conversation beginning what is a norm today. Mark Grace was 11-17 and 17 in the series with 8 RBIs. Eventually the Giants lost to the Basher, Bash Brothers and the Oakland A's in the famous Earthquake Series. In 1998, the wild card race and the home run chase. The 1998 season would begin on a somber note with the death of legendary broadcaster Harry Carey. After the retirement of Sandberg and the trade of Dunstan, the Cubs had holes to fill and the signing of Henry Rodriguez to back cleanup provided protection for Sammy Sosa in the lineup as Rodriguez slugged 31 round trippers in his first season in Chicago. Kevin Tapani led the club with a career high 19 wins while Rod Beck anchored a strong bullpen, and Mark Grace turned in one of his best seasons. The Cubs were swamped by media attention in 1998, and the team's two biggest headliners were Sosa and rookie flame thrower Kerry Wood. Wood's signature performance was one-hitting the Houston Astros, a game which tied the major league record of 20 strikeouts in nine innings. His Horrid strikeout numbers earned Wood the nickname Kid K and ultimately earned him the 1998 National League Rookie of the Year award. Sosa caught fire in June, hitting a major league record 20 home runs in the month, and his home run race with Cardinal slugger Mark McGuire transformed the pair into international superstars in a matter of weeks. McGuire finished the season with a new major league record of 70 home runs, but Sosa's 308 average and 66 homers earned him the national MVP award. After a down-to-the-wire wildcard chase with the San Francisco Giants, Chicago and San Francisco ended the regular season tied and thus squared off in a one-game playoff at Wrigley Field. Third baseman Gary Gaeta hit the eventual game-winning homer in the playoff game. 
the wind propelled the Cubs into the postseason for the first time since 1989 with a 90 and 73 regular season record. Unfortunately, the bats went cold in October as manager Jack. Jim Riggleman's club bat at 183 and scored only four runs en route to being swept by Atlanta in the National League Division Series. The home run chase between Sosa, McGuire, and Ken Griffey Jr. helped professional baseball to bring a new crop of fans as well as bringing back some fans who had been disillusioned by the 1984 strike. The Cubs retained many players who experienced career years in 1998, but after a fast start in 1999, they collapsed again, starting with being swept in the hands of the Crosstown White Sox in mid-June and finished the bottom of the division for the next two seasons. Now we're in the 2000 era. 2001 playoff push. Despite losing fan favorite Grace to free agency and the lack of production from newcomer Todd Hundley and skipper Don Baylor's Cubs put together a good season in 2001. The season started with Mark Mac Newton being brought in to preach positive thinking. One of the biggest stories of the season transpired the club made a mid-season deal for Fred McGriff, which was drawn out for nearly a month as McGriff debated waiving his no-trade clause. The Cubs led the wild card race by 2.5 games in early September, but crumbled when Preston Wilson hit a three-run walk off Homer to close Tom Flash Gordon, which halted the team's momentum. The team was unable to make another serious change and finished 88 and 74, five games behind the Houston and St. Louis, who tied for first. Sosa had perhaps the first season, and John Lieber led the staff with a 21 season. Then we have 2003. The Cubs had high expectations in 2002, but the squad played poorly. On July 5, 2002, the Cubs promoted assistant general manager and player personal director Jim Hendry to the general manager position. The club responded by hiring Dustin Baker and making some major moves in 2003. Most notably, they traded with the Pittsburgh Pirates for outfielder Kenny Lofton and third baseman Erasmus Ramirez and rode dominant pitching led by Kerry Wood and Mark Pryor. As the Cubs led the division down the stretch, Chicago halted St. Louis's run to the playoffs by taking four or five games from the Cardinals at Wrigley Field in early September, after which they won their first division title in 14 years. They then went on to defeat the Atlanta Braves in a dramatic five-game division series, the franchise's first postseason win since beating the Detroit Tigers in the 1908 World Series. After losing an extra inning game in Game 1, the Cubs rallied and took three games to one lead over the wildcard Florida Marlins in the National League Championship Series. Florida shut the Cubs out in Game 5, but the Cubs returned home to Wrigley Field with young pitcher Mark Pryor to lead the Cubs in Game 6 as they took a 3 nothing lead in the 8th inning. It was at this point when the non-infamous incident took place. Several spectators attempted to catch a foul ball off the bat of Luis Castillo, a Chicago Cubs fan by the name of Steve Bartman of Northbrook, Illinois, reached for the ball and deflected it away from the glove of Moises Alou for the second out of the eighth inning. Alou reacted angrily toward the stands after the game and stated that he would have caught the ball. Alou at one point recanted, saying, he would not have been able to make the play, but later said this was just an attempt to make Bartman feel better and believing the whole incident should be forgotten. Interference was not called on the play, as the ball was ruled to be on the spectator side of the wall. Castillo eventually walked to Pryor. Two batters later, and to the chagrin of the Pac Stadium Cubs shortstop Alex Gonzalez misplayed an inning-ending double play, loading the bases. The error would lead to eight Florida runs and 
a Marlin victory. Despite sending Kerry Wood to the mound and holding a lead twice, the Cubs ultimately dropped Game 7 and failed to reach the World Series. The Steve Bartman incident was seen as the first domino in the turning point of the era, and the Cubs did not win a playoff game for the next 11 seasons. Then we have 2004 through 2006. In 2004, the Cubs were a consensus pick by most media outlets to win the World Series. The offseason acquisition of Derek Lee, who was acquired in a trade with Florida for He Sip Choi, and the return of Greg Maddox only bolstered these expectations. Despite a midseason deal for Nomar Garcia Para, misfortune struck the Cubs again. They led the wild card by 1.5 games over San Francisco and Houston on September 25th. On that day, both teams lost, giving the Cubs a chance at increasing the lead to 2.5 games with only 8 games remaining in the season. But reliever Latroy Hawkins blew a save to the Mets, and the Cubs lost the game in extra innings. The defeat seemingly deflated the team as they proceeded to drop six of their last eight games as the Astros won the wild card. The one and only Dearman 2019. Hi, Uncle Donald. Nice to see you, Dearman. It's been a while since I've seen you in the channel. Hope everything's been fine with you. Despite the fact that the Cubs had won 89 games, this fallout was decidedly unlovable as the Cubs traded superstar Sammy Sosa after he had left the season's final game early and then lied about it publicly. Already a controversial figure in the clubhouse after his cork bat incident, Sammy's actions alienated much of his once fan base as well as few teammates. Still on good terms with them, many teammates grew tired of Sosa playing loud salsa music in the locker room and possibly tarnished his place in Cubs lore for years to come. The disappointing season also saw fans start to become frustrated with the constant injuries to ace pitchers Mark Pryor and Kerry Wood. Additionally, the 2004 season led to the departure of popular commentator Steve Stone, who had become increasingly critical of management during broadcasts and was verbally attacked by reliever Kent Merger. Things were no better in 2005 despite a career from a career year from first baseman Derek Lee and the emergence of closer Ryan Dempster. The club struggled and suffered more key injuries, only managing to win 79 games after being picked by many to be serious contender for the National League pennant in 2006. The bottom fell out as the Cubs finished 66 and 96 last in the National League Central. Pop in the chat. Yes, I'm good. All right there, Dearman. Just wanted to make sure we haven't seen you in a while. Wanted to make sure everything was fine. Refresh the chat here and continue on with our history lesson here. All right. So in 2007 and 2008, back to the division titles. After finishing in the National League Central with 66 wins in 2006, the Cubs retooled and went from worst to first. Oh, I'm doing fine there, Dermot. In the offseason, they signed Alfonso Soriano to a contract at eight years for $136 million and replaced manager Dusty Baker with fiery veteran Lou Pinella. After a rough start, which included a brawl between Michael Barnett, Carlos Zambrano, the Cubs overcame the Milwaukee Brewers, who had led the division for most of the season. The Cubs traded Barrett to the Padres and later acquired catcher Jason Kendall from Oakland. Kendall was highly successful with his management of the pitching rotation and helped at the plate as well. By September, Giovanni Soto became the full-time starter behind the plate, replacing veteran Kendall. Winning streaks in June and July coupled with a pair of of dramatic late inning wins against the Reds led the Cubs ultimately clinching the National League Central with a record of 85 and 77. 
They met Arizona in the NLDS, but controversy followed as Pinella, in a move that has since come under scrutiny, pulled Carlos Zambrano after the sixth inning of a pitcher's duel with Diamondbacks ace Brandon Webb to save Zambrano for a potential Game 4. The Cubs, however, were unable to come through, losing the first game and eventually stranding over 30 base runners in a three-game Arizona sweep. The Tribune Company, in financial distress, was acquired by real estate mogul Sam Zell in December 2007. This acquisition included the Cubs, however, Zell did not take an active part in running the baseball franchise, instead concentrating on putting together a deal to sell it. The Cubs successfully defended their National League Central in 2008. Uh, going to the postseason in consecutive years for the first time since 1906 to 1908. The offseason was dominated by three months of unsuccessful trade talks, with the Orioles having second base Brian Roberts as well as the signing of Chunichi Dragon, Dragons of star Koski Fukudome. The team recorded their 10,000th win in April and establishing an early division lead, Reed Johnson and Jim Edmonds were added early on and Rich Harden was acquired from the Oakland Athletics in early July. The Cubs headed into the All-Star break with the National League's best record and tied the league record with eight representatives in the All-Star game, including catcher Giovanni Soto, who was named Rookie of the Year. The Cubs took control of the division by sweeping a four-game series in Milwaukee on September 14th, and a game moved to Miller Park due to Hurricane Ike. Zambrano pitched a no-hitter against the Astros, and six days later, the team clinched by beating St. Louis at Wrigley. The club ended the season with a 97-64 and record and met Los Angeles in the NLDS. The heavily favored Cubs took the early lead in Game 1, but James Loney's grand slam off Jack Dempster changed the series' momentum. Chicago committed numerous critical errors and were outscored 20-6. to In a Dodger sweep, which provided yet another sudden ending. Then we have from the the Ricketts era from 2009 to the to the present. The Ricketts family acquired a majority interest in the Cubs in 2009, ending the Tribune years. Apparently handcuffed by the Tribune's bankruptcy and sale of the club to the Rickcliffe siblings, led by Chairman Thomas S. Rickcliffe's Ricketts, the Cubs' quest for a National League Central three-peat. St- Uh, started with notice that there would be less invested into contracts than in previous years. Chicago engaged St. Louis to see a in a seesaw battle for first place into August of 2009. But the Cardinals played to a torrid 26 pace that month, designating their rivals to battle in the wild card race, from which they were eliminated in the season's final week. The Cubs were plagued by injuries in 2009 and were only able to field their opening day starting lineup three times the entire season. Third baseman Erasmus Ramirez injured his throwing shoulder in early May in an early May game against the Milwaukee Brewers, sidelining him until early July and forcing journeyman players like Mike Fontenot and Aaron Miles into more prominent roles. Additionally, key players like Derek Lee, who still managed to hit 306 with 35 home runs and 111 RBIs that season, Alfonso Soriano and Giovanni Soto also nursed nagging injuries. The Cubs posted a winning record of 83 and 78 for the third consecutive season, the first time the club done so since 1972, and a new era of ownership under the Ricketts family was approved by MLB owners in early October. Then we have from 2014 
or 2010 to 2014, The Decline and Rebuild. Rookie Starlin Castro debuted in early 2010 as the starting shortstop. However, the club played poorly in the early season, finding themselves 10 games under 500. At the end of June, in addition, longtime Carlos Zambrano was pulled from a game against the White Sox on June 25th after the trade shoved shoving match with Derek Lee and was suspended indefinitely by Jim Hendry, who called the conduct unacceptable. On August 22nd, Lou Pinella, who had already announced his retirement at the end of the season, announced that he would leave the Cubs prematurely to take care of his sick mother. Mike Quaid took over as the interim manager for the final 37 games of the year, despite being well out of playoff contention, the Cubs went 24-13 and under Quaid, the best record in baseball during that 37-game stretch, earning Quaid the manager position going forward on October 19th. On December 3rd, 2010, broadcaster and former third baseman Ron Santo died due to complications from bladder cancer and diabetes. He spent 13 seasons as a player with the club, Cubs, and at the time of his death was regarded as one of the greatest players not in the Hall of Fame. He was posthumously elected to the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame in 2012. Despite trading trading for pitcher Matt Garza and signing free agent slugger Carlos Pena, the Cubs finished the 2011 season 20 games under 500 with a record of 71 and 91. Weeks after the season came to an end, the club was rejuvenated in the form of new philosophy as the owner Tom Rickett signed Theo Espin away from the Boston Red Sox, naming him club president and giving him a five year contract worth $18 million and subsequently discharged manager. Mike Quaid. Epstein, a proponent of sabermetrics and one of the architects of the 2004 and 2007 World Series championships in Boston, brought along Ed, or Jed Hoyer from the Padres to fill the role of general manager and hired Dale Savem as manager, although the team had a dismal 2012 season, losing 101 games, the worst record since 1966. It was largely expected the youth movement ushered by Epstein and Hoyer began a long-time fan favorite, Kerry Wood, retired in May, followed by Ryan Dempster and Giovanni Soto being traded to Texas at the All-Star break for a group of minor league prospects headed by Christian Valenuena, but also included little thought of Kyle Hendricks. The development of Castro, Anthony Rizzo, Darwin Barney, Brett Jackson, and pitcher Jeff Samardija, as well as replenishing the minor league system with prospects such as Javier Baez, Albert Almora, and Jorge Soler, became the primary focus of the season, a philosophy in which new management would carry over at least through the 2013 season. Just wanted to stop by before I head off to work. And oh yeah, almost forgot. Seattle Mariners. <laughs> All right there, left behind. You have a safe day at work today, okay? We'll be thinking about you. Hey there, left behind says cards in my car with our, with our Posada. A Castro, I have a ball of him auto I'm selling. Oh, that's cool. Maybe somebody might buy it. You're more than welcome to mention that to people in the channel like you already did there. Uh, Dearman. Interesting. You have a you have a Castro ball of him auto autographed. That is cool there, Dearman. All right. Uh, dun, dun, dun. So the 2013 season resulted in much of the same the year before. Shortly before the trade deadline, the Cubs traded Matt Garza to the Texas Rangers for Mel uh, Mike Ott, Mike Olt. I think it's Olt or Oit. Carl Edwards Jr. and Neil Ramirez and Justin Grimm. 
Three days later, the Cubs sent Alfonso Soriano to the New York Yankees to the minor leagues. Anyone like to buy a Castro ball for a hundred dollars? The one and only Dearman says, Starlin? Starlin? What's Starlin? Starlin Castro? There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, for minor leaguer Corey Black. All right. The midseason s- fire sale led to another last place finish in the National League Central, finishing with a record of 66 and 96. Although there was a five game improvement in the record from the year before, Anthony Rizzo and Starlin Castro seemed to take steps backward in their development. On September 30th, 2013, Theo Epstein made a decision to fire manager Dave Svem. After just two seasons at the helm of the Cubs, the regression of several young players was thought to be the main focus point. As the front office said Svem would not be judged based on wins and losses in two seasons as skipper. Svem finished with a record of 127 and 197. The 2013 season was also notable as the Cubs drafted future rookie of the year and MVP Chris Bryant in the second overall pick. Uh, All right, hey Posada and Dearman, you guys have a great day. Thank you, Left Behind. Bye, Left Behind. All right, let me refresh the chat real quick so I can continue on with our lesson and get into our next content on the channel. Getting closer here. On November 7th, the Cubs hired San Diego Padres bench coach Rick Renteria to be the 53rd manager in team history. The Cubs the Cubs finished the 2014 season in last place with a 73 and 89 record in Renteria's first and only season as a manager. Despite the poor record, the Cubs improved in many areas during 2014, including rebound years by Anthony Rizzo and Starling Castro ending the season with a winning record at home for the first time since 2009 and compiling a 33-34 and record after the All-Star break. However, following the unexpected availability of Joe Madden when he exercised a clause that, tri- he, that triggered on October 14th with the departure of General Manager Andrew Friedman to the Los Angeles Dodgers, the Cubs relieved Renteria as managerial duties on October 31st, 2014. During the season, the Cubs drafted Kyle Schwarberger with the fourth overall selection. Hall of Famer Ernie Banks died of a heart attack on January 13, 2015, shortly before his 84th birthday. The 2015 uniform carried a commemorative 14 patch on both its home and away jerseys in his honor. Then we have our last section finishing up here, 2015 to the present championship run. On November 2nd, 2014, the Cubs announced that Joe Madden had signed a five-year contract to be the 54th manager in team history. On December 10th, 2014, Madden announced that the team had signed free agent John Lester to a six-year, $155 million contract. Many other trades and acquisitions occurred during the offseason. The opening day lineup for the Cubs contained five new players, including center fielder Dexter Fowler, rookies Chris Bryant and Addison Russell, were in the starting lineup by mid-April, and rookie Kyle Schwarberger was added in mid-June. On August 30th, Jake Arrieta threw a no-hitter against the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Cubs finished the 2015 season in third place in the National League Central with a record of 97-65. and 65. The third base record in the majors earned a wild card berth on October 7th in the 2015 National League wild card game. Arietta pitched a complete game shutout, and the Cubs defeated the Pittsburgh Pirates 4-0. The Cubs defeated the Cardinals in the NLDS three games to one, qualifying for a return to the NLCS for the first time in 12 years, where they faced the New York Mets. This was the first time in franchise history that the 
Cubs had cinched a playoff series at Wrigley Field. However, they were swept in four games by the Mets and were unable to make their first World Series since 1945. Before the season, in an effort to shore up their lineup, free agent Ben Zobrist, Jason Hayward, and John Lackey were signed. To make room for Zobrist signing, Starlin Castro was traded to the Yankees for Adam Warren and Brendan Ryan, and later, the latter of whom was released a week later. Also during the middle of the season, the Cubs traded their top prospect, Gleyber Torres, and Adralis Chapman. In a season that included a no-hitter on April 21st by Jake Arrieta, the Cubs finished with the best record in Major League Baseball and won their first National League Central title since the 2008 season by winning 17.5 games. The team also reached the 100-win mark for the first time since 1935 and won 103 total games, the most wins for a franchise since 1910. For the franchise since 1910. The Cubs defeated the San Francisco Giants in the National League Division Series and returned to the National League Championship Series for the second year in a row, where they defeated the Los Angeles Dodgers in six games. This was their first NLCS win since the series was created in 1969. The win earned the Cubs their first World Series appearance since 1945 and a chance for their first World Series win since 1908. Coming back from three games to one deficit, the Cubs defeated the Cleveland Indians in seven games in 2016 World Series. They were first team, the first team to come back from a three games to one deficit since the Kansas City Royals in 1985. On November 4th, the city of Chicago held a victory parade and rally for the Cubs that began at Wrigley Field and headed down Lakeshore Drive and ended in Grant Park. The city estimated that over 5 million people attended the parade and rally, which made it one of the largest recorded gatherings in history. And then uh, in an attempt to be the first team to repeat as World Series champions since the Yankees in 1998, 99, and 2000, the Cubs struggled for the most for most of the first half of the 2017 season. Donald, they see me. <laughs> Donald, they see me. <laughs> Uh, never moving more than four games over 500 and finishing the first two games under 500. On July 15th, the Cubs fell to a season high five and a half games out of first in the National League Central. The clubs struggled mainly due to their pitching as Jake Arrieta and John Lester struggled and no starting pitcher managed to win more than 19 games. Four pitchers won 15 games more or more for the Cubs in 2016. The Cub off offense also struggled as Kyle Schwarberger bat batted near 200 for most of the first half and was even sent to the minors. However, the Cubs recovered in the second half of the season to finish 22 games over 500 and win the National League Central by six games over the Milwaukee Brewers. The Cubs pulled out a five-game NLDS series win over the Washington Nationals to advance to the NLCS for the third consecutive year. For the second consecutive year, they faced the Dodgers. This time, however, the Dodgers defeated the Cubs in five games in May. In May 2017, the Cubs and the Ricketts formerly family formed Marquee Sports and Entertainment as a central sales and marketing company for the various Ricketts family sports and entertainment assets, the Cubs, Wrigley Rooftops, and the Hickory Street Capital. Prior to the 2018 season, the Cubs made several key agent signings bolstering their pitching staff. The team signed starting pitcher Hugh Darvish to a six-year, $126 million contract and veteran closer Brandon Morrow to a two-year, $21 million contract in addition to Tyler Chatwood and Steve Sishak. However, the Cubs struggled to stay healthy throughout the season. Anthony Rizzo missed much of his April due to a back injury and Bryant missed 
almost a month due to shoulder inj- injury. How, however, he, Darvish, who only started eight games in 2018, was lost for the season due to elbow and triceps injuries. Morrow also faced two injuries before the team ruled him out for the season in September. The team maintained first place in their division for much of the season. The injury-depleted team only went 16-11 and during September, which allowed the Milwaukee Brewers to finish with the same record. The Brewers defeated the Cubs in a tiebreaker game to win the Central Division and secure top seed in the National League. The Cubs subsequently lost to the Colorado Rockies in 2018 National League wildcard game for their earliest playoff exit in three seasons. In our last section here, the Cubs roster remained largely intact going into the 2019 season. Uh, The team led the Central Division by a half game over the Brewers at the All-Star break. However, the team's control over the division once again dissipated going into the final months of the season. The Cubs lost several key players to injuries, including Javier Baez, Anthony Rizzo, and Chris Bryant during his this stretch. The team's postseason chances were compromised after suffering a nine-game losing streak in late September, and the Cubs were eliminated from the playoff contention on September 25th, marking the first time the team had failed to qualify the playoff for the playoffs since 2014. The Cubs announced they would not renew manager Joe Madden's contract in the end of the season. And on October 24, 2019, the Cubs hired David Ross as their new manager. And there you have it, the team history for the Chicago Cubs. Man, the Cubs had some bad luck with injuries. Yeah, they did some of those years, didn't they? All right, let me take a brief brief intermission here. Let me uh, take a moment to freshen up a little. Catch my breath from reading that lengthy history. By the way, um, this was one of the bigger ones, and I did kind of save it for last for that reason. Uh, we are at the hour and a half mark, but we do have time to, to get some other things done. Looking forward to that. Let me get a sip of water real quick here. We've got six people watching. So in light of that, we didn't make it to the double digits for the hobby box. But we will we will go through and open up some of these player medallion card packs. See who we can f- pull out of these. Um, and we'll see if we do get... So we were up to six. I know we're up down to five now, but when I finished my lesson, I looked up there, I seen we had six people watching. So let me pull out. I'm going to set these away for now and get the table ready here for our next part of our stream here. For those that are still hanging out with me in in the background or, or wherever you might be watching appreciate you being here if we do have more people show up try and get my attention and we will open more but i'm going to take my little spacer bar out here for now and take out six of these pack three four five six since we did have six we'll open up six of these coin packs here and put my spacer bar in there to keep them all from falling over here kind of go that way will it uh i don't want to push them or bend them we'll just leave that there for now there we go that'll kind of hold them in place um i'm gonna just close the flap here momentarily not fully closed just kind of there hold on There we go. That'll kind of hold them out. I'll put this away for now. I'll readjust everything so we can open up six of these packs and see if I can get six more in the set that I'm trying to finish here. All right. Let me get uh, these all lined up to hold uh, the cards that we'll pull out of these packs. And we will go to town with these. 
Okay, we got one, two, three, four, five, six. Five and six. All right. I tried to get interaction in here and see how it can go. So we do have five people. Uh, the one and only Dearman. Me, me, me. <laughs> That's right. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up. Thumbs up. We only made it up to seven. That's why maybe YouTube didn't send anybody our way. So we did not get any. Let me see if I can. I think I got them all in the screen here. I just made an adjustment. Let me. There we go. Okay. So here's what we're going to do now. I know there's only a few people watching. But I'll let. You guys choose at least. Uh, let me check my participants list here. See who it chose. I got cards in my car with our Posada, John Fishman, and the one and only Dearman. Look like they are in the stream. So you guys will all get a turn to choose a pack, and we'll go from there. So I need you to choose a one, two, three, four, five, or six. One, two, three, four, five, or six. I'll see the first one that pops up in the chat here with a choice. As soon as it shows up. Cards in my car with our Posada says number five. All right. So we will do that in my usual fashion here. I've got a few penny sleeves ready here. And we will just go to town here. John Fishman says seven. I don't have seven packs, John. <laughs> you have to choose one one through six. Pack five is already chosen. Come on, you knew better than that, John. Dearman says one, so we'll do one next after uh, our Posada's pack here. And then if John ever decides to choose a, a pack, we'll do that. If we had seven people watching, I could, I could add a number seven on there. All right. So let's see who we've got here for our first player medallion card here. I'll do it in my reveal fashion. You guys figure out who the initials might be. Tops player medallion, MB, MB. Uh, any ideals on that, people? MB. Uh, I don't think... No, that would be probably RH for Rice Hoskins there, Dearman. <laughs> or maybe your pack one might be Rice Hoskins, huh? Any thoughts on who MB might be? I think it might be Mookie Betts. Oh, there we go. There we go. Milton Bradley. Could be Milton Bradley. I don't think he plays baseball, does he? He's got a, a, card, a, a board game company, don't he? Mookie Betts with the Los Angeles Dodgers. There we go. There we go. A nice Mookie Betts there with the Los Angeles Dodgers. So let's put Mookie Betts in a penny sleeve and get him in a top loader here. Let me push him in here get him in the top loader there we go Mookie Betts we'll put that kind of over here because that's where that one was chose from all right yeah you guessed it right there Dearman <laughs> that was a good guess not Milton Bradley okay and then Dearman said pack number one we'll go ahead and open up this pack number one next so we still have two, three, four, and six. You gotta choose two, three, four, or six there, uh, John. And we are still at six watching. So we'll see if it ends up popping up to seven watching. If it does, we'll open up another one. All right, let's get and find out what the initials of this one are. Tops player medallion Y A Y A. All right, John says number six. Tops player medallion num letters initials for the player name Y A. 
that uh, Jordan Alvarez or yeah, little. Oh, there you go, Jordan Alvarez. That's the one Deerman's guessing. Jordan Alvarez with the Houston Astros. There we go. You're doing pretty good there, Deerman. I'm guessing the initials. You've been you've been doing your homework. You're doing pretty good. So Jordan Alvarez. I gotta adjust something here before this box. I don't want this box to tip over on me. Let's get Yordan Alvarez in here in this top loader. So we'll get him good to go here. I do it this way so when I file them away, I put them in so I can find them easier in alphabetical order. So that's why I put those in order. So Yordan Alvarez here. And then now we've got next is uh, John Fishman. All right, John Fishman is next. Up to bat. He chose number six. That's right, you're two for two there, Dearman. You're doing pretty good on knowing your homework for your baseball players and the initials. Oh, is that what you want? <laughs> All right, so let's see here. For our third pack for the day, we still got six watching. We haven't made it up to seven yet. But let's go up here and see who we've got for our third one here. Tops player medallion initials BM. The initials BM. Any thoughts on BM for the initials of the baseball player? Give the little uh do 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 bum 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 da, 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 da. blowing money fast <laughs> blowing money fast <laughs> Brandon McKay says Robert M Robert Posada and it is Brandon McKay, Brandon McKay with the Tampa Bay Rays. I don't believe I've got this one, his rookie card, Brandon McKay, rookie card. All right, get that in there. Might be a new one. I don't know for sure if I've got the Brandon McKay yet. I don't believe I do, but I could be wrong. Let me get a... Put this one in a top loader here. And still have six people watching. Six people watching. There we go. Brandon McKay. Nice color match on that with the, the colors for their uniforms. All right. So that one was kind of on this edge here. Now we're going to go... All right, yeah, we can go another round. All right, Deerman chose number two. So we got number three and number four still left. Number three and number four still left. So let's go ahead and go through this real quick. Um, I, I, You're just getting one piece at a time, right? It says, Donald, I ordered the cable I need for my camera. <laughs> John. Oh, wait, yeah. The one and only Darren Rice Hoskins or or Darren says or <laughs> all right let's see who we've got for initials on this one to do the slow reveal here make a little bit fun tops player medallion B H B H B H any thoughts on this one? Uh, we will be doing a co-stream soon. Okay. <laughs> I'm still waiting. I still haven't got no emails from you yet there. Bo. Bo ho. Bo who? Bryce Harper? Oh yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be Bryce Harper. Could be Bryce Harper there. And the winner is, that was the guess for Robert Posada. 
Bryce Harper, he got it right with the Philadelphia Phillies. Bryce Harper for the Philadelphia Phillies. <laughs> I will email you. All right there, John. I'll be looking forward to it. So here we go. Oh no, this is my last larger oversized penny sleeve. But Bryce Harper haven't gotten any short prints in a while here. Should be due for a short print out of one of these packs coming out soon. Um, it's on my homepage on my YouTube channel there, John. But it's donaldblomdahl at gmail.com. donaldblomdahl at gmail.com. So there we go. We got a Bryce Harper with the Philadelphia Phillies. I know I've got a bunch of I've got a couple of the Rice Hoskins, I believe. But there we go. A Bryce Harper. Now I've got that in my medallion collection. All right. So we got one, two, three, and four. Three and four. Three and four. So again, Donald Blomdahl, all one, put it all scrunched together at gmail.com. Donald Blomdahl at gmail.com. Okay, that's my my YouTube email address so I got number three and number four to go two more to go might just have to put it in the sleeve without a penny sleeve on it is my guess Alright, cards in my car says number three. That means number four will be last. Alright. And I'll I'll let John choose that one. Can you type in number four, John? That way I'll have my you'll you'll each have your two picks. Because we're still standing steady at six people in the stream. So let's see who we've got for the slow reveal on this one. The slow reveal on this one shows it's a Topps player medallion EJ. EJ. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. John said number four. We're going to open up number four next. Um, EJ. I think this might be, uh, let me do the drum roll. Eloy, there we go. Matty G, where'd Matty G come from? Must have been lurking out in the background. Just emailed you, Donald. Okay there, John, thanks a lot. Um, but Eloy Jimenez, there we go with the Chicago White Sox. Wish it would have been the Lewis Robert, that's for sure. The Lewis Robert would have been awesome. That's for definite sure I don't have a penny sleeve so I think these are just these slide right in here even without a penny sleeve so I can save on the penny sleeves for the most part until I get some more but the Eloy Jimenez the, of course like to get the Lewis Robert the Lewis Robert would be awesome I think there's a Lewis Robert and the, the commemorative coins as far as I know, I think there's a Lewis Robert in here. Maybe not. Yeah, there is a Lewis Robert. I have not got the Lewis Robert. But that would be nice to get the Lewis Robert. All right, John Fishman says... Uh, but thanks there, Matty G, for popping in at the last second here. And I just looked up on the screen and I see we are going to open up another pack. I have I, I show seven people in the stream now. So we're bumping up there. Don't forget, thummies up, thummies up, thummies up for me. Uh, thanks, Robert. Kevin's card collecting and more. Better late than never. Howdy, everyone. Oh, you, Kevin showed up. That must have popped it up to seven people watching. So in honor of Matty G and Kevin's car collecting and more jumping in here, I'm going to grab one more pack. Oh, no, we got eight. We're up to eight. We get to open up two more packs. Let's get those numbers rolling up. Get those numbers rolling up. 
Let's see who we've got for this one. Pack number six. <laughs> All right, I just got the notification there, John. Thanks for that email. I'll check it out in just a little bit here. Uh, my email address is junkwaxhero with stars in my eyes at yahoo.com if anyone wants to do a video. Oh my word. That's a long one. That's a, hand, that's a mouthful. All right, so let's see who we got here. We got a, oh no, oh no, this could be awesomeness. We got a, t <laughs> a top player medallion, initials MT, initials MT. Could this be a Mike Trout? This would be totally awesome, especially if it would have been a sh short print. It doesn't look like it is, judging by the color. But we got a Mike Trout player a medallion card from series two boom that's a good hit mike trout that's a good one even though it's not the lewis robert that is a good one for number six we were up to eight so i will take i will grab uh two more out of the box here and we will let uh, Maddie G choose one and Kevin choose one. All right, so let's put the Mike Trout over here. Let's put the, actually, hold on. Let's put the Brandon McKay, because that's a rookie. Let's put the, the Mookie Betts down here. I'm going to put the Mike Trout up here. That is an awesome... I know I don't have a Mike Trout yet. I'm trying to get the big name ones. They're the harder ones, I think, to pull. But, nonetheless, we were up to eight. So I'm going to pull out two more out of my box here. Two more out of my box here. If I can not knock any... Here, I'm going to just move this out of the way for now. It'll get, It's going to be easier. And I'll make sure I don't drop anything outside of bumping it. So I'm going to pull the next two packs out of the box. All right. We've got these two here. So uh, Kevin's card collecting. And more. And Maddie G. Uh, very nice hit. People in the chat. Uh, what topic do you want to see Donald and I cover? Hi, Mrs. Donald. Hi, Mrs. Donald. Do you see Mrs. Donald in here? Did she pop back in? Did Mrs. Donald pop back in here? I meant to say Mr. Donald. Oh, okay, Mr. Donald. Mr. Donald. Oh, there you go. I meant to say Mr. Donald, and my wife said, but, hi, Mrs. Blombaugh. <laughs> Robert left Robert in there. <laughs> all right so we're up to seven but we were up to eight if we do get higher i'll pull another pack out of the box but kevin's card collecting and or uh, maddie says left so i'll go right okay did maddie say left already so uh let's see maddie says left so i'll open up the left one first and then this one will be in honor of Matty G. Okay, so let's see. Deerman's, if Deerman's still in here, he's he's kind of the leader in everything so far. He is kind of like the leader in everything so far. So, um, as far as guessing the initials, so for the Tops Player Medallion, MS. MS. Any thoughts on the MS? Any thoughts on the MS? 
any thoughts on the MS? Did I did, did I mysteriously show you? Any thoughts on MS besides Max Scherzer? There we go, Max Scherzer. Dearman got it again. Matt Stram, Max Scherzer for our seventh player medallion card. Let me get Max Scherzer in here into the top loader and put him off to the side here. Sorry. It's there we go. Try and get it semi sort of centered, maybe or down towards the bottom. But there we go to Max Scherzer for number seven. And then Kevin said on the right, uh, why did why do you think that I think why do you think that I think numbered? <laughs> Haven't got any numbered yet, have we? Nope, no short prints yet. But here we go, number eight, because we were up to eight earlier. I did see it get up to eight. So in honor of that, we will go on to pack number eight. And this is the one that Kevin chose on the right side of the two. Or it's just dissing. Dissing? What dissing? <laughs> Oh, Dearman, don't worry. But it is nice to see you around here, Dearman. We haven't seen you in a long time. Appreciate you being here. So let's see if we've got, what do we got next here? Next, we've got a Topps Player Medallion, JD. 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 Any thoughts on the JD? That would be nice to get an autograph. That's for sure. Uh, DeGrom? Jacob DeGrom? Is that the one there, Kevin? Jacob DeGrom with the New York Mets. There we go. Matty G and Kevin. Jacob DeGrom with the New York Mets. There we go. Awesome card there. A little rough on the edges up there on that one. Somebody got dinged somewhere along the way. We still got seven people watching. If we got up to nine by chance before I end the stream, I'd probably open up one more pack. So let me um, slide this one into the top loader here. All right. So Jacob DeGrom with the New York Mets. So there we go. We've got seven cards, eight cards done today in my search to complete my 2020 commemorative coin 50 card set. There's 10. All right. We got, uh, we got nine watching. We got nine watching. Who else jumped into the house here? Who else jumped, in, jumped into the house here? We've got one more, one more. We got 10. Boom, boom, boom. We've got nine watching. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let me pull one more pack out here and let's open up another one. If we get to 10 by the time I, before I do my sign off, we will go. So that is cool. Nine, nine watching with 10 likes. Do like that very much. Appreciate everybody popping in at the last minute here. We are at 1210 and just hit the the two hour mark on the live stream. All right. So let's continue on here. Hit let's hit the big one. Exactly. Number 10. Let's finally get a short print here. Let's finally get a short print. Don't know if it looks like a short print or night not. And our initials for this one are Tops player medallion K M K M. I'm thinking, I'm thinking K M K M. K 
KM. Whose who's initials are KM? Cattell Marte? Kevin Miller? Michael Kopech? <laughs> Cattell Marte? My guess. Boom! Quarantine fan Tim Marte. Cattell Marte with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Shout out to Kevin's card collecting and more for his Arizona Diamondbacks. There we go. We got eight people watching, but we had up to nine people watching just a second ago. So that is our ninth one. I don't know for sure if I have a Cattell Marte already. But I will verify it and see how many I do have. But there we go. It's nice to see you, Dragon Fan Tim. I haven't seen you in a while. Thanks for popping into the stream here. Let's see. I've got to scoot everything back, I think, so I can make room here. So let me scooch these back a little bit. So I can make a little bit of space here. You guys having fun hanging out with me? If you are, we can maybe do some more of these, these here. I do kind of want to see if I get any more short prints on these. It's like a fleck of something there, but that's okay. Eloy Jimenez. Jacob the Grom, Eloy. There we go. Put those there. We can put it. Uh, Cattell Marte right here. All right. How do we got eight watching ten in here? Yay! Hope, hope. <laughs> All right. So what do we got? We've got nine in the books here. What do you think? You guys want to hang out a little bit longer? I don't mind opening up a few more of these. Or at least one more. Make it an even ten for today. That'll leave me with 20 packs left after after that one. We got nine watching. Can we get it up? Can we get it up to ten people watching? I think we can get it up to ten people watching. John Fishman. I am here till 7. Till 7? Seven. 7 o'clock? You'll stay here till 7 o'clock? Are you on the East Coast there, John? Is it like uh, three, 3 o'clock in the afternoon? I don't know if I'll stick around till 7. You should open some Magic the Gathering cards. Um, hold on to that thought just for a second. bunch of these cards uh, Marvel overpower card game I've never played this one but I'm sure there's people out there that have I do have a whole bunch of these cards and then I also have uh, one of these days I'm gonna get them listed up on on eBay I've got the, the card game this the Highlander the sword game I've got the Highlander the sword game <laughs> I've got a whole bunch of these. I got a whole bunch of these. Highlander. If you can see that there, the Highlander Swordmaster cards. You can see this is a whole big bag full of those. <laughs> but uh, I just haven't listed them up on eBay yet because I have to do a little bit of research on them first to see how much I want to try and sell them for. But yeah, 
those are different things I do have and do work on. <laughs> but I like that. Donald, you should open some Magic the Gathering. I used to have some of those. I think I sold them in my yard garage sale last year. But yeah. Um, we do have... Not, uh, I'm going to open up one more. We didn't quite get there and we're going backwards now. So I'm going to do one more. I am going to do one more of these... Uh, one more of these packs to make it an even 10 for today even though we didn't get up to 10 but i will guarantee that tomorrow in the live stream for our hall of fame friday i will open up we do got 11 thumbs up how's that sound we do got did get the 10 past the 10 thumbs up um i have to run i have a test on the book of philemon for my epistles class take care everybody all right kevin you take care Thanks for popping into the stream here. I'm going to open up this one last card real quick, and then we'll go ahead and end the stream for today. This will get us 10 more cards to see how many more I got toward completing my set. That'd be nice if I could complete the set before I open up all the packs. That way, I could sell some of these in my sale next, next Saturday. Just to give you a little heads up, I am going to have a sale next Saturday. Just in case those that are interested in participating. But let's see for card number 10 here. Let's see who we got here. Still don't know if we're going to get a short print. Doesn't look like it with the co color. Tops player medallion FT. FT. Uh, I don't think they got any Hall of Famers in this set. But FT, FT, I think these are all just current players that they did here. I don't think there are any Hall of Famers in there. Could be future Hall of Famers. Fernando Tatis, oh my word, wouldn't that be another good one to get, right? Fernando Tatis, not Frank Thomas, Fernando Tatis, Fernando Tatis, boom! Where did Kevin go? He took off. Sorry, Kevin. We got the Fernando Tatis. That would have been awesome if, it, if that would have been a short print. <phone rings> Fernando Tatis with the San Diego Padres to finish the stream. That is just an awesome one. Awesome, 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 awesome. And I got to get me one more uh, top loader here. I busted through that one. I gotta get another. Uh, these are uh, 168 point top loader, top loaders here. So that is an awesome. I know I don't have that one. Fernando Tatis with the San Diego Padres. That is an awesome one to get. I am stoked over that one. That's for sure. Stoked, 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 stoked. <laughs> my word Fernando Tatis Jr he is smacking the ball uh, around these days he is one of those star players for sure him and Lewis Robert okay get in there Blondo. okay just slide it in you got it right about center Boom, Fernando Tatis with the San Diego Padres. Boom. <laughs> I got to put him up. Bryce, Bryce Harper is pretty good there. I'm going to just put him right center above my hat here. Fernando Tatis. Boom, boom, boom. Awesomeness. All right, big worm, big pen, BWBP. What's that? Big worm, big perm. Oh, okay, okay. Are you talking about his hair? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> All right there, John. 
All right, but th this has been fun, okay? And I, and in honor of this being uh, the fourth day of some special convention that's gone on uh, for some upcoming election, and my love for our country, um, I chose to wear not my usual uh, gear for today's stream, but in honor of what is going on, um, I am 100% um a patriot tried and true to the blue so without further ado i'm going to back up instead of doing it after i turn the camera around turn the camera around say my signature goodbye and get ready to wrap things up for today so let me just turn the camera around real quick All right and get this pop down i am wearing my United States Navy retired hat and this is my emblem for sure proudly served I proudly served our country for 20 years in the United States Navy and then after that I proudly served our country for um, Donald is our favorite Democrat um, no I'm not a Democrat sorry <laughs> Sorry to offend anybody out there if you're Democrats, but I am in no way one of the Democrats. Sorry, they're Democrats, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. If you've seen my house and you see my flags I have out front, when it's a special uh, flag holiday, you will see that I am wearing a red, white, and blue shirt with pride. A red, white, and blue shirt with pride with the American Eagle on it and everything of that nature. Um, I am red, white, and blue and true all over. I am a patriot for our country and I am very proud of having served in our American military uh, for 20 years. And so uh, I just wanted to point that out. I am red, white, and blue all the way through, if you know what that means. Hopefully, if you've been taught the right things in school, you should know what that means. Red, white, and blue all the way through. I'm not going to be part of the, the people that are trying to change our country and, and have a big red flag with a, a, a little sickle going through it. Um, no, if that happens, um, we will see all our days of prosperity Prosperity in our country will have been gone. They're trying to take that away from us. The government is made, they work for us. We, the people. All right? I don't want to go on a big political stand here, but I just wanted to voice my opinion. I am red, white, and blue, and true all the way through, okay? Again, I served my country pr proudly for 20 years in the United States Navy. Then I served my country proudly as a United States Postal Service worker, delivering people's mail for 20 years. And now I'm in retirement, but that doesn't mean I can't voice my opinion. I won't push it on people, but I won't voice my opinion. I might be talking to myself and preaching to the choir, but that's okay. So I just wanted to say, you all have a great and wonderful day. Red, white, and Biden. Ew. 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 Ooh, give me goosebumps there, John. <laughs> oh, my word. But at least John's hanging out with me, tried and true to the end. Thank you there, John. So this has been Donald Blomdahl, Hall of Fame Veterans Sports Cards and Collectibles, having been live to you this Thursday. Tune in tomorrow for our Hall of Fame Fridays, and I will share with you some of the history of the Hall of Famers that were inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1949. And yes, that was way before I was born. But you all take care. Have a great and wonderful day. John, I'll be looking forward. I'm going to read your email, see what you say in there. Y'all take care and have a wonderful and blessed day. Lord bless y'all. Bye now.